Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. Um, my area of specialty is wet organic conservation. And um, it really is the Cinderella of conservation, but you'll see that it's really important. <coughs> So um, the sort of work that I do um, is very similar to work that's done um, on the Vasa in Stockholm and this warship that you'll all know very well, Henry VIII's warship in Southampton. So this, um, she was brought up in 1982 and she's been treated in the same way as the waka that I treat. But we've got wetlands too and they're throughout New Zealand. This is a map of um, wet wetlands but not wet sites so they you know they can be in a variety of different forms and fashions they can be permanent or temporary or um, salty or fresh they can be on river margins or um, on the coast and Buxton believes that only 10% of the wetlands that existed in New Zealand um, when um, people arrived still are able are still available today <coughs> so the um, for Māori, organic material was really important. Um, nearly everything that they uh, made was out of wood or bone or stone or shell. Oh, not, st not stone, organic. Um, but fibre and wood doesn't usually survive in sites just because of decay. And so when we excavate wet sites, it's um, a really crucial time for the artefacts. They lose the support that they've had for you know, hundreds of years. Um, light and oxygen are introduced and um, deterioration accelerates. So what I do is conserve the waka or these wet organic um, materials um, in a lab here in Auckland at the University of Auckland. And um, as they come on to um, our university onto our marae, they're welcomed onto the marae. So no two projects are the same. They're quite diverse and frequently as we're moving through the process we um, change tack to accommodate different um, challenges. And for me collaboration is really important right from the beginning with iwi or with Māori um, through the process of conserving and right to the end of um, storage and display exhibition. This is a map of um, some of the sites that I've um, done projects on, and you can see that there's quite a concentration on the top of the North Island, but we're slowly uh, moving down. So very briefly, wood's made up of two main components, cellulose and lignin, and when the artefacts are interred in the ground, degradation is slow, but it, nevertheless it still happens. And um, when the cellulose has disappeared, there's a lignin skeleton that's um, plumped up with water. So if the artefacts are taken out of the ground <coughs> and they're not treated, as the water evaporates off, the cells lie down, which is called cell collapse, and it's irreversible. So what we're trying to do is get the artefacts before they're dried <coughs> and exchange the water that's inside the cells that allows them to keep them sh their shape um, for a synthetic compound. And so when the, uh, when the artefacts come into the lab, there's several, five main things that we look at, traditional knowledge, um, we, look at, we do a lot of microscopy, um, cell matter content, a lot of documentation, and um, of course dating. And the method that we nearly exclusively use is that of polyethylene glycol. And the, the main reasons are that it's non-toxic, it's not flammable, um, it's soluble in water, and one of the golden rules of conservation is that um, it's reversible. Really, it's only tr retreatable. It's not completely reversible, but, but enough to retreat the artifacts. So at the moment, I've got six lab oh, I've got seven labs, but six satellite labs, and we're going to talk very briefly about two of them. Um, so on the um, Otago Peninsula, down the bottom here, and the northwest tip of the South Island. So at Papua New Inlet, it's a, it's a lovely estuary, lots of resources. Um, and as you can see here in the map below, lots of sites. And the, um, this area is continually um, eroding and artefacts are coming out daily at the moment. So at the top here you can see uh, we saw that there was a piece of wood about a metre long and 40 mils deep. And, but we could see that it was curved and we went back to, um, to excavate and as we progressed it just went under and under the sand dune and we moved about 
1.6 metres of overburden, and luckily I'd got a builder in the background, I could phone him every hour and say, can you make the tank longer? And in the end, the walker was um, 6.33 metres long. So here it is, um, when we're just about to finish, just about to free it um, from its resting place. But we were working on the Yellow Eye Penguin Trust um, Reserve and we weren't allowed to take any trucks in. And so what we decided to do in the end was wait for the tide to come back in and we lashed it to a um, padded ladder and walked it out onto a sandbar and then got Doc to bring us some um, whale pontoon. And so there we are, um, we lashed it onto the whale pontoons and walked it to Kays down the inlet to a place where we could get some trucks in. And then um, the tank which was by this time ready, um, was filled by the fire brigade and we were able to put the walker into the tank. And so this is the facility that I had built um, on Otakao Marae. It's on the peninsula there and artifacts are, as I said, coming out continually and they're brought to this facility for conservation. So very quickly, it's a, um, it's a dugout. It has a longitudinal ledge down one side, and initially we thought it wasn't bilaterally symmetrical, but when we scanned it, we could see there was a flare on the other side. And um, there's lashing holes that exist for two side strikes to, to increase the freeboard. And very close by, um, we found a, an outrigger, which means, of course, they, were not, they weren't just paddling, they were sailing. And one of the beauties of Papua Nui is that we found, well, it's an archaeologist's dream, really, that we found um, braided fibre work inside the hull and underneath the hull, and we were able to use that for dating because, as you'll know, um, there's problems with dating waka, you know, with dating trees, and that's the fibre. So those are the dates. So very quickly, we'll look at Anaweka. Um, on the northwest tip of the South Island. Again, it's an estuary and it was found in that log jam. Um, we did a lot of photography there and in the end we were able to um, come up with a, a, a five megabit stitch together of the uh, waka. It's a strake, it has um, lashing holes around the whole perimeter and four ribs and then a stringer for strength. And one of the beauties of Anaweka is that it has on the outside this embossed turtle. So turtle are very rare in New Zealand carving and this is really important given the age of the waka. So these are C14 dates that we got from the corking and we think the last voyage is around 1400 AD. So I've got a paper, we've written a paper about it if any of you are interested in reading about it. And um, this is just a schematic diagram to show you where we think the strike went. So yes, so the dates for both waka are earlier than expected um, and currently um, we think that New, Ze New Zealand's earliest migrants adapted quickly to their environment using endemic timbers and altering their um, canoe technologies. So moving from using planks to lash the canoe together to dugouts. And this is us at Papua Nui, we're running out of time and tide and um, but a nation stays alive when its culture stays alive, and that's what we try to do. Thanks. Thank